What would you do if you heard rumours about a mystery illness, a deadly disease carving a sway through towns and cities? Just over two years ago, this was the situation most of us were facing for the very first time in our lives, and I'm sure you can still remember the uncertainty and the anxiety and the preparations you made. Sitting there, watching the briefing every night, wondering what was coming next. 375 years earlier, a far more deadly plague was ravaging its way through Scotland. Two young ladies, seeing how things were, made their plans to withdraw from society, make a rural sanctuary for themselves and ride it out together. It was a good plan, but sadly it didn't work. The plague came for them anyway. My name's Jenny Shaw, and welcome to the Handed Down podcast. Each episode celebrates a different traditional song, either through storytelling or an interview. And in today's episode, we're on the trail of a song and a tune that share the same name. I recently learned that the idea that tunes and words have a permanent bond is quite a new one. It sounds strange to us now, but it turns out that in the past, tunes were more interchangeable. A singer might draw on their repertoire of tunes when attempting a new broadside ballad. And broadsides were often produced as just a set of words, with a suggestion as to which well-known tune would fit them best. Today we have two intertwined stories, one about a tune and the other about a ballad, a set of words. And while they undoubtedly travelled along together for a good couple of hundred years, they most likely had different origins, and they're rarely paired together today. The song and the tune are both called Bessie Bell. As always, both give rise to tall tales and colourful characters, and they're going to take us from Scotland to the heyday of popular London theatre, which is further back than you might think. There's also a treat for old manuscript lovers, and we've got lots of links to all those things in the show notes. But our story begins in Perthshire, Scotland. Bessie Bell and Mary Gray It's quite a simple song of two young ladies, bonnie lasses who sought to escape the plague, but failed. Now I grew up with the Steel Eye Span version of this song, so I know it as Betsy Bell and Mary Gray, but most of the original sources have it as Bessie Bell, so that's what we'll call it today. What makes this song stand out is that there's evidence that rather than being just characters, they were real women. In the introduction to the 1904 book English and Scottish Popular Ballads, Francis James Child quotes from a letter written in 1781 by Major Barry of Lednock, Perthshire. When I first came to Lednock, I was shown in a part of my grounds called the Dranachor, a heap of stones almost covered with briars, thorns and fern, which they assured me was the burial place of Bessie Bell and Mary Gray. The tradition of the country relating to these ladies is that Mary Gray's father was a laird of Lednock and Bessie Bell's of Kinvade, a place in this neighbourhood, that they were both very handsome and an intimate friendship subsisted between them, that while Miss Bell was on a visit to Miss Gray, the plague broke out in the year 1666, in order to avoid which they built themselves a bower about three quarters of a mile west from Lednock House, in a very retired and romantic place, called Burn Braes, on the side of Boshiburn. Here they lived for some time, but the plague raging with great fury, they caught the infection. It is said from a young gentleman who was in love with them both. He used to bring them their provision. They died in this bower and were buried in the Dranach Hoare at the foot of a bray of the same name and near to the bank of the River Almond. The burial place lies about half a mile west from the present house of Lednock. A transcript of this letter can still be found in the Proceedings of the Society of Antiquities of Scotland. Major Barry goes on to relate, rather touchingly, how he cleared the grave, planted it with flowers and fixed a memorial stone in the wall to the two women. 
Child points out that the date 1666 was almost certainly wrong, as the plague was not in Scotland that year. So even in Major Barry's time, we're definitely in the realm of hearsay and legend. And in fact, although they're clearly believed to be real people, I've had some real trouble finding any hard evidence of this. What we know seems to have been based on local oral tradition. A good summary of what was known, or believed to be known, can be found in the Highland Notebook, or Sketches and Anecdotes, an 1843 book by Robert Carruthers. Talking of the plague in Perthshire and the attempts made to avoid it by escaping to the country, he has this to say. And thither, among others, according to the tradition of the country, went Bessie Bell, the daughter of the Laird of Kinvaid, and Mary Grey, the daughter of the Laird of Lidnock. They were both eminent beauties, the flowers of almond water. The infection was accidentally carried to their bower by some young gentleman who came to visit them in the solitude, and both died and were interred on the spot. The dread of contagion had, no doubt, prevented their internment among their noble kin. Lord Lidnock has put an iron railing round the grave and planted some yew trees beside it. The peasantry had long decorated it with flowers, and all the lads and lasses made annual pilgrimages to a spot consecrated by so many tender and affecting associations. The scene is well calculated to deepen such impressions, It is at the foot of a high bank, completely sheltered and concealed by a wood, but in front of the place where the fair friends begat their bower is a plot of delicious greensward, visited by the setting sun, and the river murmurs past with a ceaseless but gentle flow that gives it a feeling of something like life and animation to the secluded scene. Many of our old ballads and airs have a melancholy character, but there is none more touching than this of Bessie Bell and Mary Grey. It is a romance of the heart, and on such a subject a few rude verses have a secure foundation. Even Queen Victoria's progress in Perthshire will be sooner forgotten than this simple country story, and the grave of the unfortunate maidens will be visited when the royal footsteps have ceased to be remembered. A compelling account, and as far as I can tell, that's all we know of this historical pair. The grave can still be found to this day on the bank of the River Almond, surrounded by the iron railings put up by Thomas Graham in the early 1800s. I've not been there, but there are photographs. Who is buried there, if anyone, we can't know, but over the years it's become a place of pilgrimage. At one time the site was covered by a pile of stones, brought there one by one by travellers. There was even a poem about it in the Edinburgh Literary Journal of 1829. Tis hallowed ground, hushed be my breath, uncovered be my head. Let me the shadowy court of death with softest footstep tread. The spirit of the place I feel, and on its sacred dust I kneel. For here, all lowly laid, as ancient legends smoothly say, rest Bessie Bell and Mary Grey. Thrice hallowed is this lonely dell, three spirits all divine, Love, innocence and friendship dwell here in one common shrine. Here youth and virgin fair may meet, may plight their vows by moonlight sweet, may heart and hand entwine. No faithless foot this turf may tread, for here they reign, the sacred dead. Two beautiful young ladies, a tragic end and a picturesque rural setting was nothing less than 19th century catnip. And there's no wonder that the grave attracted a constant stream of gloomy artistic types. No doubt I'd have been one of them if I'd had the means. But despite all this oral tradition and local legend, the song itself is surprisingly light on detail. We don't hear how, after taking so much trouble to self-isolate, they ended up catching the plague. You'd think that might be of interest. We do, however, learn a few other strange details about things which took place after their deaths. They would not have their boots of red. They would not have them yellow. But they would have their boots of green. To ride through the streets of Yarrow. 
Why though? They thought to lie in Methrin Kirkyard among the noble kin. But they must lie in Stranach Hall all out beneath the sun. Carruthers account suggests this was an infection control measure, but does it also signify something else? I'm intrigued as to why they decided not to isolate themselves with other family members in the house they were staying at, presumably belonging to one of their fathers. Why did they flee together like that? There are theories that they were a couple, which they might have been, and that it was this transgression that prevented them being buried in the churchyard. To me that seems unlikely, given how much the local oral tradition celebrates their friendship. If they were a couple it would have been relatively easy to hide behind a romantic devotion that wouldn't have seemed out of place for a woman of their time and class. Others suggest they were practising witchcraft, which is sometimes associated with the colour green, the colour of their shoes. But there's nothing in the local tradition about witchcraft, and you'd think that would be quite noteworthy. So the song is actually a bit of an enigma, quite different from the legend, mysterious and dark, rather than tragic and romantic. Unless, that is, you're the Scottish poet Alan Ramsey. His version of Bessie Bell was first printed in a pamphlet in Edinburgh in 1719. Later, in 1725, it appeared in a book called Orpheus Caledonius, and then a few years later in Ramsey's own book, The Tea Table Miscellany. The version of Bessie Bell in this book starts with the usual four lines, and then it goes into a series of verses in praise of the beauty of both ladies. It's a textbook example of the male gaze. The narrator declares he cannot choose between the two of them. It's rather contrived, and there are allusions here and there to Greek mythology. It certainly doesn't resemble what we'd consider to be a folk song today. He finishes, Then I'll draw cuts and take my fate and be with Ain contented. Hmm. Iona Opie author of the Oxford Dictionary of Nursery Rhymes, traces the roots of the song almost to the time of the plague itself, saying, The ballad was known in the late 17th century since there was a squib on the birth of the old pretender in 1688 beginning Bessie Bell and Mary Grey, those famous bonny lasses. A squib is a short satirical poem, usually about a public figure. But there do seem to be several versions of this song during the 18th century. Iona Opie has a suggestion here. Bessie Bell might have been a traditional name, used interchangeably in many songs. Bessie Bell and Mary Gray also appear in a nursery rhyme, versions of which can be found in both the UK and the United States, and it goes like this. Bessie Bell and Mary Gray, they were two bonny lasses. They built their house upon the lee and covered it with rashes. Bessie kept the garden gate and Mary kept the pantry. Bessie always had to wait while Mary lived in plenty. There's even a theory that in this version, Bessie Bell and Mary Gray were the two daughters of Henry VIII. It's true that while Mary Tudor was on the English throne, Elizabeth's position was often very precarious. Elizabeth was put under house arrest for almost a year and came very close to being executed. So in that sense, Bessie did have to wait while Mary lived in plenty. But charming as this theory might be, it does sound like a bit of a stretch for a simple children's rhyme. The traditional tune for Bessie Bell is not the one we sing today. For most of the ballad's life, it's been accompanied by a jaunty little Scottish tune that seems to have been very popular. Several versions of it can be found in Playford, and it was often used as a stock tune for new ballads. tune also pops up in a rather unexpected place. Let me tell you about James Guthrie. James Guthrie was a Scottish Presbyterian minister. He was also a covenanter, 
a campaigner for a Presbyterian church in Scotland and was part of the separate church formed briefly under Cromwell. When Charles II was restored to the throne in 1660, James Guthrie was betrayed, arrested, tried and executed for treason and his head decorated Edinburgh's city walls like a grisly monument for 28 years. In the early 1800s, a book of his sermons was discovered, likely written by a clerk during Guthrie's lifetime. But what makes this manuscript so interesting is the fiddle tunes that adorn some of the pages. Now, these were written by someone else, but not long after, and they're written in an unusual tablature. And there are 62 of them, only half of them known elsewhere. Some of them have got very unclerical titles indeed. Once I loved another man's wife, for example. Katie thinks not long to play with Peter at even. And my lady's <laughs> is hairs upon. But interesting as this is, there's an even earlier reference to this tune, because as it turns out, the tune is older than the song's characters. Its first known appearance was on a broadside dated the 22nd of June, 1629, when it's given as the tune for a cheeky little ballad called Fourpence Halfpenny Farthing, that being the price of the lady's virtue. One morning bright, for my delight, into the fields I walked. There I did see a lad, and he with a fair maiden talked. It seemed to me they could not agree about some pretty bargain. He offered a groat. But still her note was fourpence, halfpenny, farthing. This is the work of a 17th century professional ballad writer, Martin Parker. He wrote numerous ballads and was incredibly popular, both during his lifetime and in the hundred years after his death. I'm sure we'll come back to him in another episode. It should be said that there's more than one tune in circulation today called fourpence, halfpenny, farthing. But Martin Parker's original broadside clearly gives the tune as Bessie Bell, or A Health to Betty. Now, these are two quite different tunes, but they both fit the song. The tune of Bessie Bell that can be found in Playford, the same one used by Alan Ramsey, fits the words for fourpence, halfpenny, farthing really well. So, I would say it's almost certainly the same tune in 1629 as it is in Ramsey's book. So the tune and the name Bessie Bell came before the characters themselves. I found this a bit disappointing because it suggests Bessie Bell and Mary Gray are fictional after all, or at best that some local tragedy was retrofitted to an existing name and tune. One thing I have taken away from this though is that the tune A Health to Betty is the most perfect fit for the song Bessie Bell. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that we've been robbed of the song's rightful tune. Oh, Betty Bell and Mary Gray, they were both bonny lasses. They built a bar in yon burnside. They heaved it all over with rushes. Okay, maybe it's a little bit too Baroque for a folk song of today, but if anyone wants to have a go at a more traditional sounding version of this tune, then I'd love to hear it. But if the original tune predates the story itself, it also goes on to have a life of its own. In fact, in the 18th century, it became a huge hit, wrapped up in the phenomenon that was the ballad opera. In 1728, a new show called The Beggar's Opera launched at the Lincoln's in Fields Theatre in London. Written by John Gay and with music arranged by Johann Christoph Pepuschk, it sparked a hugely popular, though short-lived, form of entertainment. In contrast to the rather stuffy Italian opera, it was racy and satirical and edgy. It had tunes you already knew and you could whistle along with and its characters were very familiar to Londoners, beggars and thieves and prostitutes. Ballad opera was popular in London bourgeois society for perhaps 30 or 40 years. The beggars' opera and the many similar shows that came after it often used folk tunes such as those published in Alan Ramsey's collections. 
the tune Bessie Bell appeared in at least 18 ballad operas, including the Beggar's Opera itself. And subsequent shows with such intriguing titles as Lord Blunder's Confession and The Wanton Jesuit. In those days, musicians had a lot of creative control over the songs, arranging them, in some cases deciding which popular songs to use, and writing additional material as needed. One of the most successful theatre musicians from those times was one Mr Sido, a German musician who made London his home and worked for many years at the famous Drury Lane Theatre, the world's oldest theatre in continuous use. We know that he arranged Bessie Bell for at least one of the ballad operas it appeared in, The Mock Doctor. He was also the genius behind the hugely successful show, The Devil to Pay, and all in all, he was a bit of a one-man hit factory. His strength as a musician was in his adaptability, and he could turn out music in whatever style was popular at the time. Some of his songs were still in print in the 19th century. In fact, he might be the most popular composer you've never heard of. But then, during the second half of the 17th century, the public suddenly lost their appetite for these cheeky, satirical shows and started instead to develop a taste for a more wholesome and serious version with pastoral themes and a blend of original music and folk tunes. And just like that, the ballad opera disappeared as quickly as it arrived. Was within a furlong of Edinburgh town In the rosy time of year when the grass was down Bonnie Jockey Blythe and Gay said to Jenny making hay Let us sit a little dear and prattle, tis a sultry day He long had courted the black brown maid But Jockey was a wag and would ne'er consent to wed Which made her pish and poo and cry out It will not do, I cannot, 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 will not, will not buckle do it's no surprise to me that the song Bessie Bell and Mary Gray has survived into modern times. It has all the qualities of a popular, contemporary folk song. It's short, vivid and a little bit mysterious. But unlike some of the other songs that are featured on the show, it's not a remnant of a longer ballad. It's more as though a local legend has adopted some floating verses in a short song, perhaps even a children's song, because it does have a childlike quality and it pops up as a nursery rhyme. And the tune we use today has a simple childish quality as well. It could easily be a skipping rhyme, and it's not a million miles away from ring a ring a roses a song which probably isn't about the plague as it turns out. I've been chasing old ghosts all the way through this episode, and I'd love to know who lies in that romantic grave in Perthshire. One possibility is that the women lived and died, as per the local legend, but earlier. The Black Death was in Scotland from the 14th century, so perhaps an earlier outbreak put them in their grave. Or perhaps the grave is filled with nothing more than several centuries of romantic dreams. Stay tuned after the song for a little bit of 18th century fun. Thank you. 
Alan Ramsay was born in Lanarkshire, Scotland, in the late 17th century. He became a poet, writing in both English and Scots, and had an interest in old songs. It's sometimes difficult to see in his work where the editing of older manuscripts stops and the original writing begins. In a collection of his poems and songs, published in Dublin in 1724, there is a most wonderful dedication that I want to share with you, and it goes like this. To the most beautiful, the British ladies, fair patronesses, for your innocent diversion and to invite those engaging smiles which heighten your other beauties, the most part of my poems were wrote, having had the pleasure to be sometimes approved of by you, which was the mark I chiefly aimed at. Allow me then to lay the following collection at your feet. Accept of it as a grateful return of every thought happily expressed by me, they being less owing to my natural genius than to the inspiration of your charms. Very smooth, Mr. Ramsay. I imagine him as Mr. Collins from Pride and Prejudice when I read that introduction. But joking aside, Alan Ramsay did have a distinguished career and he contributed a great deal to Scottish literary tradition. If you'd like to take a peek of him, his face can be found on the Scott Monument in Edinburgh. Thank you for listening to Handed Down. As well as story episodes like this one, I also interview folk musicians about their favourite traditional songs. If you like the show, you can support us by telling others about it and do subscribe on your favourite podcast app. We'll be back again soon with more folky stories, but until next time, you take care.